So I'm Kate Mulvaney from Cornwall Insights. I'm a senior consultant and I work with people across energy um, to help them on their decarbonisation journey. Today, I'm joined by Frank Hodgson of Regen, an organisation of uh, energy systems experts, and also from David Cowdery of MCS, who are a charity that help decarbonise homes, heat and energy. We're going to talk a little about energy networks and some of the challenges that are occurring. So first of all, Frank, can you do uh, can you provide an introduction to the report? Yeah, sure. And um, thanks, Kate. Thanks for having having both David and I on. So the one thing that every electric car charger, heat pump, solar panel uh, and electrolyzer has in common is that they're all going to need a connection to the grid. And um, it's quite widely recognized now that the grid is a critical enabler of net zero and, and our wider strategic goals. So Regen and MCS, we really wanted to set out in some detail, but in plain English and an accessible format, what the big challenges are in preparing the grid for net zero. And broadly, uh, we think we think that the different areas of the grid, there are different challenges. Um, one of them is connecting millions of electric car chargers and the heat pumps into the low voltage local parts of the grid. Uh, and then in the middle, the transmission distribution inf interface, um, we see connecting gigawatts of onshore generation as a real challenge. And that's something that a lot of people in the energy system at the moment are, are screaming about. Uh, and finally, we we also think that the grid is absolutely critical to achieving the UK's ambitious goals for offshore wind. And we also wanted to look at what it costs. Everyone rightly uh, wants to know what it's going to cost. And so we looked at that as well. Um, but our key message really from this report has been preparing for net zero is achievable, but we just can't delay. We've got to make the reforms across the grid right now. David, your organisation commissioned this report. Um, uh, why do you think this is something that we all need to think about at the moment? Well, uh, the, the reason we commissioned the report at MCS Foundation was really to answer the questions we were being asked in Parliament by policymakers. Well, can the grid cope, you know, with the electrification of heat? Uh, and we've seen a lot of scaremongering going on, uh, false narratives. So what we wanted was some in-depth research by credible partners that would be able to provide the knowledge and the basis who worked with the sector for a long period of time to provide that insight to help inform policy decisions. And the, the good thing for us is that it's been debated in Parliament. We have an energy bill going through at the moment. But the answer people want to know is if you do put heat pumps on or solar PV on your roof, can you connect it to the grid? If you've got a new wind uh, turbine uh, that you're putting up, can it be connected to the grid? If you're putting in a solar array, can that be connected? And again, if you're putting in a wind farm, can that be connected? And we wanted to see what investment would be required by the sector, how it could cope, could the grid manage with all of this? And the thing that we really appreciate about the research is it came back and said, yes, the grid can cope. So for us, it was very, very positive, but it needs the investment and it needs the investment at a scale that hasn't been seen for a long time. And so this report is providing a template for the government to go forward. Uh, and that's the reason why we commissioned it. It's to answer the questions, inform the policy and the debate and to bring about real change, because the only way that we can reach net zero is through the electrification of heat uh, and by using the grid system that we've got and making it fit for purpose in the future. So for us, that's the reason why we did the research. Uh, and of course, we went out and found the best organisations to provide that with the best market insights. And I think that gives it credibility. And that's what we wanted, especially for highlighting the issues to government. It's certainly coming at a time when uh, network connections are, are are being increasingly acknowledged to be fundamental to that energy transformation. Um, you know, mentioned there, it's being debated in Parliament. Some of the movement we've seen in the wider industry, for example, the um, energy system operators five point plan, they show that movement going in the right direction, even if we're not quite there yet in terms of that pace of change. So this additional report. Um, absolutely useful, I think, to a lot of the audience. So, Frank, the report that's being produced is 
as you mentioned, it's very much intended to be accessible to people, even if they're not yet experts around network connections. So with that in mind, what do you think the key takeaways are from the work you've done, the research and the report? Yeah, so the purpose of the report is exactly that. It's to demystify what is a really quite complex area. Um, and so if you do download the report, um, we go and we go into a bit of detail on the various issues, but we don't assume any any expertise. So we've tried to explain all the key terms and the uh, the kind of the way that these the networks are run. So one of the, my big takeaways from this exercise has been just how different the scale of the challenge is at different parts of the grid. So on the one hand, we're trying to connect millions of electric vehicles and heat pumps into the local part of the network. So this is the uh, the cables and transformers near your home. And that really is less of a technical challenge. The networks upgrade these cables on a daily basis, um, but it's much more about them getting ahead of an inevitable increase in demand. And so something that we've called for is basically for the distribution network operators to get out there and get reinforcing before they get swamped by um, a wave of upgrades. And they also need Ofgem, the regulator, to release contingency budgets ahead of time so they can prepare their supply chain. In the long term, we also think Opgen really needs to reform the price control process. That, so that kind of local upgrades is a really different challenge to connecting hundreds of gigawatts of generation that we need to see on the transmission network and the high voltage part of the grid. So there's been, as you mentioned, uh, the ESO, the electricity system operator, has uh, set out its tactical five point plan. There's been a raft of something point plans coming out, which has been quite tricky to follow. But our key message here is basically there's lots of key uh, important initiatives underway, looking at things like um, how we're going to reform the queue. But we need to move quite quickly from planning and action plans into implementation. I think one of the things that struck me whilst researching this area is this is not unique to the to the to the GB energy system. Every system that's trying to rapidly decarbonize is facing these same challenges. Connection queues globally are are very, very stretched. Um, and that's and a good are, thing in some ways. You know, absolutely. that's a, it's a sort of it's a um it's great that investors have the confidence and developers have the confidence to go and put these applications in. So I, in some ways, it's a good it's a good thing. No, absolutely. It's a sign of success. Um, and the, the increase in mass low carbon generation, um, the, the confidence around investors, uh, this is this is a uh, this is a good sign. Obviously, it's not a good sign if it can't be resolved. Um, but there are these options out there um, that, that that are based upon your your research that, that need to be explored further. Um, but David, is there anything from uh, from anything else from MCS that um, that stood out in particular? to you. Of course, you've commissioned research here. Um, you wanted to find out more. Um, you wanted a report that people would find credible. But is there anything that really stood out to, to you when, when you read the report of being um, a, of being of real interest or a, a key fact? Well, for, for me, I suppose we set out um, to find independent, impartial res research um, by credible experts. And the report did respond to the question, can the grid cope with a massive shift towards electrifying heat and transport? Uh, and the answer is very clearly with the right investment, yes. So we have a grid that can cope. And I think there was a lot of speculation, well, can the grid cope or not? But it is with the right investment at the right speed. Uh, and there are a number of things for me about Ofgem's role of um, perhaps within the energy bill, there's um, speculation that Ofgem should have a net zero remit, which I think is absolutely critical. Uh, the review of electricity market arrangements, again, absolutely critical. But for me, it's saying there is clearly work that needs to be done. And the other standout factor for me in the report was this is a roadmap for government to actually achieve the transformation we need of our electricity system. Uh, and as Frank said, it is very complex. There are very different needs between the low voltage requirements uh, and actually getting those gigawatt wind farms online. Uh, and, and clearly there's a backlog that is going on with some of those licenses to be able to get them um, working. There is reform that needs to be done about the market. And for me, 
this was all really positive. We've got a system that can cope, a system that can work. It needs investment at an unprecedented level, and we can do that. And at the end of the day, electrification of heat, getting those heat pumps online, getting solar PV online, and getting your EV charging points at home all work. And for me, this is a very positive message where there is now a roadmap for the government to take forward. I really like your optimism there. And I think for me, if I could if I could summarise anything from this report, it is that um, although there are very, very significant challenges, um, these are solvable. There's a, there are a range of options out there that, that are really worth that serious exploration. Um, and certainly those put forward in this report um, uh, are, are included in that group. So I think um, I liked how optimistic it is because rather than just throwing our hands up in despair at these challenges. As an industry, if we engage and if we engage with the, the evidence, we will find the right solution. So with the right policy steer, we can move forwards. Um, so well, I would, uh, I would say, Kate, it's it's realistic. It's not just optimistic. You know, we we at Regen, we did some modelling with um, with the ESO last year as part of our day in the life project, which looked at how would a net zero power system operate? We reckon we need about 200 gigawatts of generation, so about double what we've got currently. Um, and when you look at what we've connected in the past, it's been about three gigawatts, just above that per year of low carbon capacity. So we need to maybe double that, maybe maybe triple it, but it's not it's not massive increases. You know, this is this is achievable. So I think, yeah, we we sort of it's not necessarily an optimistic view. It's just it's just a realistic view of what's um, of what's needed. A realistic view, I like it. Um, so any final thoughts? Uh, David, I'll come to you first. For me, it's just, um, we've now got this. It's now a chance for the government, the regulator, the network operators to urgently take this forward. Uh, th th this is your roadmap. Take it forward, get the investment, release the funds that need releasing, support the facilitation of this. Um, and, and it has to be the number one priority. If we want to decarbonise homes, heat and energy, the only way we can do that is by investing in the grid now. And as Frank said, to preempt the investment that's going on, to preempt rather that the demand that's going to be happening, we need to do the investment now. So I would say to the government, you know, we need to act fast. Regulation is absolutely critical and the regulator behind it needs that net zero remit and we need to review the electricity market arrangements as well. And Frank, any final comments from you? Yeah, well, just to follow on from what David said about investment, I think um, people are rightly worried about costs. But this, I think finally the government has actually realised that this is the root of expensive imported fossil fuels. So uh, the commodity cost element of the bill, which is what's been really driving the wholesale cost, which is what's been really driving these high bills, it's through renewables, moving to renewables and off fossil fuel generation. That's how that's going to fall. And we've looked at the network costs as well. And even those can fall in the long term because the electricity network is just going to be delivering so much more electricity. So per unit, those network costs will come down. So, yep, I echo what David says about this is achievable. We've got to crack on with it. But I also think it's important that people hear the message that, um, that this isn't going to cost the earth and that this is this is affordable. Well, thanks to everyone for listening today. I've really enjoyed hearing these views from MCS, Charitable Foundation and Regen. The research they've done is really interesting and I encourage you to check it out. There's a lot going on in this space at the moment. Um, so if this is something you want to explore further, then do get in touch. Um, otherwise, everyone have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>